morning today. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say a special thank you to Professor Ronick for uh, her guidance and support in doing this project. Uh, a special thank you to my physics friends who came to the talk today, bringing us outside of our windowless labs, and uh, to the uh, our friends from the Detroit Public Library who joined us for the talk today. And thank you to everyone else for coming as well. Uh, so how this is going to go today, we are going to start by talking, uh, I'll start talking about uh, the research that I did for my writing intensive project for my classics degree. And then at the end, I'll turn it over to Professor Ronick, and she will let you know more about uh, current happenings with the Detroit Public Library, because hopefully my goal for this talk is to pique your interest in uh, what's happening at the DPL and send you on your way over there to visit and support uh, such a fabulous institution in our city. So the concept of the zodiac uh, is found throughout the ancient world from Greece to Babylon to Egypt and designs featuring the zodiac can be found in floor and ceiling decorations of the ancient architecture of multiple cultures. And as neoclassical architecture maintained popularity from the 18th to the 20th century, we continue to see examples of the zodiac being used in modern buildings. One architect who seemed particularly fond of this motif was Cass Gilbert. And Gilbert used zodiac motifs in several of his designs, such as the Capitol Building in St. Paul, Minnesota, the St. Louis Public Library, and closer to home, the main branch of the Detroit Public Library. Gilbert incorporated a zodiac motif in the extended tile floor of the loggia on the third floor of the library. And the purpose of our presentation today is to discuss the importance of zodiac in ancient culture, Gilbert's classical influences, and finally compare several of the signs found in the DPL uh, to classical and renaissance examples. So for most people, when you say zodiac, the first thing that comes to mind is horoscope. I could ask any of you, what is your sign? And you probably would be able to tell me. Uh, I was, for, uh, for this purpose, I was looking on my phone in the app store to see just if I did daily horoscope, how many apps would come up, and there were hundreds of them. Uh, and not only do you have day-to-day -day advice based on your sign, you also have overarching traits that go with that. So using myself as an example, I am an Aries, which means I am a fearless leader, I'm majestic at speaking my mind, but taking that in the opposite side, it also means that I'm very bossy uh, and get upset when I don't get my way. I also found out that sheep have teeth, and that's a completely disturbing <laughs> thing. <laughs> now, as an astronomer, the fastest way to make me or another astronomer sad is when they tell you that they study astronomy to let them know that you are a Capricorn, because astronomy and astrology are not the same thing. Um, in the classical world, they were very much intertwined uh, but when we get into a modern sense of astronomy, you know, we don't have that interspersion anymore. And, you know, being Aries, those personality traits have nothing to do with my birthday being in April. It probably has a lot more to do with the fact that I am the oldest child in my immediate family, and I'm the only girl in my family, so I'm very used to getting in my way. But designating uh, traits along with signs isn't a new thing. This is something that's around in the classical world as well. And we see this in chapter six of the Satyricon written by first century CE author Petronius. And his character Trimalchio describes the signs of the zodiac at a dinner party. Uh, quote, this heaven in which dwell the 12 gods resolves itself into 12 different configurations and presently becomes the ram. So whoever is born under this sign has many flocks and herds and much wool, a hard head into the bargain, a shameless brow, and a sharp horn. Most of your schoolmen and pettifogers are born under this sign. Next, the whole sky becomes the bull. Then are born obstinate fellows with, and neat herds, and such who think of nothing but filling their own bellies. Under the twins are born horses in a pair, oxen in a yoke, men blessed with a sturdy brace of testicle, and all who manage to keep it in with both sides. I was born under the crab myself, wherefore I stand on many feet and have many possessions, both by sea and land, for the crab is equally adapted to either elements. Under the lion are born great eaters and wasters, and all who love to domineer. Under the virgin, women and runaways and jailbirds. Under the scales, butchers and perfumers and all retail traders. Under the scorpions, uh, poisoners and cutthroats, under the archers, squint-eyed folks who look at the greens and whip off with the bacon, under Capricorn, the horny-handed sons of toil, under Aquarius or the waterman, innkeepers and pumpkin heads, under Pisces or the fishes, fine cooks and fine talkers. 
And while some of the humor of that passage may be lost on us because we're 2,000 years removed from it, I really think this kind of encompasses the attitude that modern day astronomers have towards the idea of astrology. Because while the zodiac doesn't mean to us the same thing it means to astrologers, it still is important in astronomy. So if we go on to look at this little cartoon I borrowed from Wikipedia, the signs of the zodiac lie along the ecliptic, and this is the path that we see the sun take through the sky. So as we go into different seasons, so the sun has different stars in its background. And this is why it's important to us, not because if you're a Scorpio, you should avoid Sagittarius or anything like that. And it, this was also important during the time of uh, the classical world, because <clears throat> We didn't have iPhones and cell phones and all of that stuff to help us understand the calendar and time. So uh, in book two of Historia Naturalis, Pliny the Elder says that the zodiac is, quote, divided by forms of 12 living creatures through which the sun uh, is the sun's track. So the motion of the constellations for them was important for uh, farming and use as a calendar. And we see this brought up in Hesiod's work and days. Uh, where he talks about the open star cluster found in the constellation of Taurus, saying, when the Pleiades, daughters of Atlas, are rising, begin your harvest and your plowing when they are going to set. He also mentions stars that are not in zodiacal constellations, but are nearby, giving advice when Orion and Sirius come into the mid-heaven and rosy-fingered dawn sees Arcturus, then cut off all great clusters and bring them home. But when the Pleiades and Hyades and strong Orion are set, are begin to set, then remember to plow in season, so that the completed year will fitly pass beneath the earth. So these sorts of things were very important, and this is just a little, uh, this is the ecliptic here. You can see uh, Taurus, the Pleiades would be right up here. If you look in the western sky just after sunset, you're able to see them. They're on their way out for the year. And uh, we had rosy-fingered Dawn seeing Arcturus, who is right above Virgo here, and is this bright star. It's going to show up pretty high in the sky as kind of a yellowy-orange color. <clears throat> so those are kind of practical things that the Zodiac was used for. And something that in my research I found that was also interesting was uh, using uh, heliocentric images in classical Zodiacs. Even though the idea of heliocentrism wasn't really adapted until the 16th century, it was proposed as early as uh, the 3rd century BCE by Aristarchus of Samos. So when you can see in the middle of both of these, uh, you have a figure with a radiate crown. And in Greek and Roman uh, mythology, the radiate crown is either in, uh, associated with Helios, the god of the sun, or in later Roman times with Sol Invictus. Uh, who uh, Constantine the Great was actually a very, very big fan of before he uh, converted to Christianity. So now that we have our background, this is a good time, I think, to introduce our hero of the story, and that is Cass Gilbert. And Cass Gilbert was born on November 24th, in, uh, 1859, in Zaneville, Ohio. The Gilbert family relocated to St. Paul, Minnesota in 1868. And at age of 17, Gilbert began his architectural career by taking an internship with Abraham Radcliffe. And after doing this apprenticeship for a couple of years, he started an architecture program at MIT, which he only completed one of two years of, and then he decided he wanted to go do uh, survey work instead. And doing this, he was able to save up $420.00. And with that $420, he was able to go on an eight-month sketching tour through England, France, and Italy. Uh, so I really wish that was something that was an option for us today. But this tour was a very important time for him. Uh, and I really think that this influenced the course of his architectural design going forward. Uh, in a note that he wrote to a friend who was thinking of doing the same sort of thing, uh, Gilbert suggested to read general history of the place that he was going, rather than the architectural history, saying, quote, Become familiar with events. Great epochs are the dates in architecture. Styles place themselves when you are familiar with the history of the country in which you may be. And so seeing these sorts of things in Europe before he came back and began his career, uh, were really influential to him. And we see the evidence of this influence in his two main types of, of architecture that you see. The first being Georgian architecture, which is influenced by Palladian architecture, uh, which was created by 16th century Italian architect Andrea Palladio, 
which in turn was influenced by first century Roman, or first century BC Roman architect uh, Vitruvius. And this is kind of the architecture that resembles ancient temples. So things with pillars, the archways, uh, all of that kind of stuff falls into that category. He also was very influenced by Gothic architecture, which emerged from Renaissance architecture, which came from Romanesque architecture. And this is where uh, the ideas of symmetry and proportion, uh, along with what came from Vitruvius, are really important. So after returning from his trip, uh, he began building residential and commercial buildings, but his first big break came uh, in 1895 when he was selected to design the Minnesota State Capitol building in St. Paul. And this really opened the door for Gilbert to move from a, a kind of a regional realm where he was designing buildings in Minnesota, in North and South Dakota, in Iowa, Wisconsin, to a grander scale, uh, kind of at the time culminating in his uh, design of the Woolworth building in Manhattan. Uh, this is probably one of his most famous buildings. It was completed in 1913, and from the time of its completion until 1930, it was the tallest building in the world. Uh, but even though he was made very famous by this, he actually was kind of sad about this building. And in a letter that he wrote to fellow architect Ralph Adams Cram on December 23rd, 1920. He says, I fear that it may be regarded as my only work that you and I both know that whatever it may be in dimension and in certain lines, it is, after all, only a skyscraper. For that reason, if my work is to be illustrated, I should like to have it include something else, as, for example, the Detroit Public Library, the Minnesota Capitol, the New York Custom House, and the Army Base in Brooklyn. And this building is highly Gothic, and I'm going to show you some of the other buildings mentioned in that letter, and we're going to see uh, less Gothic, more Georgian aspects here. So the first one was the uh, library in St. Louis, and this building also has zodiac motifs, and they're actually on the little medallions on the outside of the building. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was not able to make a trip to St. Louis to take pictures of them, and the people at that library did not actually have access to them, so they were not able to send them to me. Uh, and also, we already saw a picture of it, but the Minnesota State Capitol Building also has zodiac motifs in it as well. Uh, and then that brings us to us at the Detroit <coughs> Public Library. This building was started in... Uh, he, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. It was completed in 1921, and kind of the little feather in his cap towards the end of his career was the design of the U.S. Supreme Court building. And this is where we see, uh, there's very little Gothic architecture here, but we have a lot of the pillars. Uh, the use of the windows and the friezes and stuff is a very, I think, strong uh, example of his preference of classical architecture. So, bringing ourselves back to the Detroit Public Library. Uh, the DPL was established uh, by a state law in 1842 requiring the Detroit Board of Education to open a library, and this resulted in a public reading room being opened on March 25th, 1865. So we're about a month removed uh, from the DPL's 150th birthday. Uh, so that's very exciting. Uh, and in 1872, the Center Park Library opened across the street from the current location of the Skillman Branch, which is downtown on uh, Gratiot and Library Street. So this building isn't there anymore, uh, but the Skillman Branch is there. And so this was the library for a while until we have another hero coming in in the form of Andrew Carnegie, uh, who in 1910 donated a lot of money to the city of Detroit. And then Detroit decided that they were going to have a contest to see who would be in charge of designing the new branch of the library. And Gilbert won that contest in 1913. And when he was applying for this, one of the things that he said was that if he were to build this building, he would endeavor to make a design which should be as pure and as fine as example of the best period of the Renaissance. And we're going to see a lot of these aspects uh, when we get into the actual designs of objects in the building. Now, even though this building was, start, uh, the, the proposal, we started building in 1915, it wasn't completed until 1921 because there were issues with funding. And also World War I happened, which really put kind of a kink in the plans of getting that put together. 
So and now that the building was completed, what kind of classical influences do we see? Well, we see the arches in the front of the building. You can see them here. We also have the white marble facades. There's the second floor arcaded loggia with fluted ionic pillars. And all of these things on the outside also have uh, things on the inside. For example, Gilbert said Frederick Wiley, who was one of the interior designers, to the American Academy in Rome uh, in 1920 to 1921 to study Italian Renaissance ceiling treatments for adaptation in the library here. And if your interest has been piqued at the end of this talk, uh, on Monday, May 4th, there's going to be another talk at the library uh, discussing the ceiling motifs uh, of Aesop's fables. So that's also a Wayne State student and should be a very good talk as well. So now that we have all of our background information, let's start talking about the actual signs of the zodiac. And, you know, even though uh, I'm, I'm fond of being an Aries, right? We're going to start there. And this is because Aries is kind of the signifier of spring and the new year. And this isn't something that's only seen in uh, Roman Greece. But in the book uh, titled Ancient Calendars and Constellations, Emmeline Plunkett states that, quote, not only the Egyptians, but also great civilized nations of the East had traditions of a year beginning when the sun and moon entered the constellation of Aries. Such a year as that is in use amongst the Babylonians during their long existence as a nation, and such as that which is used by the Hindus in India today. Now, this is not the constellation of the vernal equinox anymore because Unfortunately, while the Earth is spinning on its axis, it also wobbles, or if we're going to be sciencey, it precesses on its axis. If you've spun a top, when the top is going very, very fast, the handle sticks straight up in the air. But as it starts to slow down, it starts to wobble around that axis of rotation. And that's basically what the Earth is doing. So as time progresses, the Earth wobbles away from whatever direction it's pointing. And so we're also going to touch on mythology of each of these. So the mythology of Aries, uh, this is supposed to represent the Golden Fleece that was sought out by Jason and the Argonauts. So going on to the next sign, uh, we have Pisces, which in, uh, when you read your horoscope, it's always at the end of the year, but thanks to precession, Pisces actually is the beginning of the year now because that is the constellation the sun is in during the vernal equinox. Uh, and looking at this, this myth is involving the Titan Typhon, uh, tormenting people, and the fish represent Aphrodite and her son Eros. They were trying to escape, so they turned themselves into fishes and tied themselves together. And you see in different motifs uh, different ways that they're tied together. So looking at the zodiac of Dendera, which is from 50 BC, uh, you see them tied together by their tails. And looking at the example from the DPL, you see them tied together by their lips. But if you look at the Darius zodiac, which is uh, Roman era Egypt, uh, you also see them tied together by their lips. And we'll see a couple of examples where we see various ways that uh, these motifs are exhibited. So the next constellation we have is Capricorn. And this used to be the, camp, the constellation of the winter solstice, but precession is going to cause problems throughout all of these. Uh, and this constellation actually has its roots in uh, the cultures of Sumeria, which in that culture was identified as a half-goat, half-fish creature. And also in Babylonia, it was portrayed as a half-goat, half-human. Uh, so one thing that we'll run across is that in multiple cultures, they look at batches of stars and they're all kind of seeing the same thing. Uh, and this, uh, in mythology, is supposed to represent uh, Pan, trying to escape the fiery breath of Typhon, so he turns himself into a fishy goat and jumps into the river to try to swim away. And something that's very interesting about this sign and why I chose to use a uh, 16th century bronze cast of this is because of the longevity of the sign, because this sign is going back all the way to ancient Sumeria. Now our next sign is Cancer which used to be our summer solstice constellation, but no longer is. And uh, one of the things that I found really interesting using the Darius zodiac, which has a uh, Roman zodiac here on the outside and then the Egyptian equivalent here on the inside, we see that uh, the Roman version of Cancer is a crab and the Egyptian version of Cancer is a scarab. So even though they are different animals, uh, they still look kind of similar. So again, it's that kind of looking at a batch of stars and seeing the same thing. 
And there are two instances of cancer uh, at the DPL. We have the cancer that is on the loggia outside. And also, we have uh, a little cancer that is hanging out on one of the iron gates uh, on the entrance to the room that the loggia is attached to. So the first four that I showed you, these were all outside. The other ones that I'm going to show you are found in other parts of the library. So now, oh, and the mythology, poor cancer. So fighting the Hydra was one of Heracles' labors, and when Hera saw that he was winning, she decided to send Cancer down to help the Hydra. Well, Cancer was not a very good fighter, and he got down there, and this goes one of two ways. Either Hercules gave Cancer a hard enough of a kick that it just booted him up into the sky, and he became a constellation there, or uh, Hercules just kind of stomped him to death. And so Hercules was kind of a jerk. Uh, so Hera felt bad and then put him up into the sky that way. So moving on to Taurus the bull. Uh, Taurus is again one of our earliest constellations and this goes back to the early Bronze Age. And during that time, uh, Taurus was the constellation of the vernal equinox. And the instance of Taurus that I looked at at the library, we have the, the mosaics out on the floor of the loggia. We have the ironwork on the gate to the door of the room the loggia is in. And then the room across the hall from there, we also have uh, stained glass. So this is an instance of Taurus in, that, in the glass, uh, which I think is very nice, compared to from the zodiac of Dendra, a little bowl there. And this, going back again very far, this can either be Zeus uh, in, his, in his bull form taking away Europa, or can go back farther to that, to the Epic of Gilgamesh, where after Gilgamesh spurned Ishtar, she decided to send a bull after him to get him. Uh, so I think that's nice. <laughs> and I don't know what it is about classics, but they always make the women into the bad guys. So this constellation, uh, this is for Gemini, and this is on the Iron Gate. And instead of using a, uh, another zodiac motif, I wanted to incorporate, uh, well, we're mostly focusing on architecture. I also wanted to show that this symbolism shows up in other aspects of the classical world. So this is a silver dry, dry drachm uh, from the third century BC in Rome. And you have Gemini the twins here. You also have Gemini the twins there. And above their heads are two little stars. And this type of coin is very uh, like, uh, persistent throughout the classical world. Uh, instead of being called Gemini, they get called the Dioscuri. And you either see them in forms like this, you see them in form of the two stars, or you see them riding horses off together. Sometimes you see all of them. Uh, so this is a very, uh, this was a motif that people were very fond of during the classical world. And you also see it adapted when uh, deities stopped being the only people who were allowed on coinage. Uh, after Julius Caesar was assassinated, Mark Antony actually put out a coin uh, portraying himself and Julius Caesar as the Dioscuri, but only one of them was on the horse. The other horse was riderless, showing his mourning uh, for the loss of Caesar. You know, he went to battle after that, so whether he was really sad or not, or just trying to get public sympathy, sympathy for what he was going to do, is another question. And the mythology behind this, Pollux and Castor were twins. Uh, their mother was Leda, but they both had different fathers. Pollux's father was Zeus, and Castor's father was uh, the king of Sparta. And when Castor died, uh, because he was mortal, uh, Pollux was very upset by this and begged Zeus to uh, give his brother immortality so they were both put up into the sky. Now we're going on to Leo, and unfortunately I was not able to find lions in the DPL, so you guys are going to have to go and see if you can find a Leo hiding somewhere that I was not able to find him. So I did put up the asterism of Leo because uh, Leo, the sickle of Leo here is something, I didn't use a quote for it, but it was also something that would show up uh, as far as farming was concerned and knowing when it was time to plant and harvest your crops. And I wanted to show the two different examples. We have a little leaping lion here in the Darisee Zodiac. And then when we go forward to the fifth century, uh, I think that's, I just think it's super cute, which is why I put it up there. Uh, but this is from, uh, uh, this is a Jewish zodiac sim, uh, circle. And now that I, point, I pointed that out, it made me think about it. We see a decrease in the number of zodiacs showing up after Christianity really takes over. However, we don't seem to see a decrease in them in the world of Judaism. 
So I think that's something cool to think about. And uh, Leo is actually probably the earliest recognized constellation with archaeological evidence of it being known of by the Mesopotamians as early as 4000 BC. And in the culture of the Persians, of the Turks, of the Syrians, of the Indians, all of these cultures have named this constellation a word that means lion. So again, I, this one I can see. I look at that and I'm like, yep, that totally looks like a lion. His head, his paws, his back, and his tail are over here. So in Leo is one of the, I apologize, my planetarium comes out sometimes. Leo is one of our very nice springtime constellations that you should be looking for in the nighttime sky right now. I also was not able to find a Virgo. There were some, uh, in the ironworks, there were some uh, figures, but I couldn't tell if they were female figures, so I wasn't confident enough to put them on there. Uh, but again, from the Talaris Bath Zodiac, here is a sign of Virgo. And uh, she is associated with the goddess Demeter, and, or Ceres, depending on if you're doing Greek or Roman. And Spica, which is this very bright star down here, actually means ear of green in Latin. Uh, so this again goes back to how important the stars were in relationship to planting and harvesting of crops. So the next one that we have is Libra. Uh, Peter, I'm a Libra. <laughs> Um, and this is actually the only zodiac symbol that is not, uh, it often is shown being held by somebody, but it's the only sign of the zodiac that isn't some kind of living creature. It's not a person or an animal. Uh, and so for the Babylonians, this was scales. For the Greeks, this was not scales. This was not a separate constellation. This was actually the claws of Scorpius the scorpion. But then when you get back to the time of the Romans, they were like, yeah, it's scales again that are being held by justice. And now we're getting into some of our summertime constellations. We have Scorpius the Scorpion here. Uh, and this is in the iron work here. And Scorpius is the southernmost of the zodiac uh, constellations. So the sun actually spends the least amount of time in this. But it also has a lot of very bright stars, which made it a very popular thing to talk about. Uh, on its back, it has a very bright red supergiant called Antares. And it also has a visible binary star system, uh, Omega Scorpii which one of the stars is blue and one of the stars is gold. So in the summertime, this is a very nice thing to look for. Uh, and the mythology for Scorpius is that Orion either was friends with uh, Diana or he was rude to her and bragged about being a better hunter. But then Scorpius and Orion battled each other and both ended up falling in that battle. And so when Orion got put up in the sky and Scorpius got put up in the sky, the Greek gods didn't want them up at the same time, so they wouldn't continue fighting. So if you see one of them in the sky, you will not see the other. The real reason for that is because they're on opposite sides of our orbits. So if we can see one of them, when the other one is up, there's this big yellow thing in the way, making it not possible for us to see them. Uh, so going to Sagittarius, our archer. Um, it was not known at the time, but Sagittarius is important to us because it points to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And while the ancient people, the ancients didn't know that, oh, there's a supermassive black hole four million times the mass of the sun hanging out there, or, uh, they did know that something was going on because uh, if you think of the composition of the Milky Way, you have a bulge of stars in the middle and then a nice disk. And because this is in the middle, it's in the area of the bulge, so it has a lot of fuzzy, brightness hanging out in that area. Now, sometimes it's shown as a centaur, and the mythology around Sagittarius is a little bit confusing because maybe it's Chiron who was the teacher of Jason, uh, but there's also a constellation called Centaurus, who is supposed to be Chiron, the teacher of Jason. So sometimes we see Sagittarius as a horse, or a, excuse me, a centaur, and sometimes we just see him as an archer because that's what Sagittarius actually means. So either way is acceptable. Uh, so it may be just that his arrow is pointing in a direction to help the Argonauts on their journey. So our last zodiac symbol that we have today is Aquarius. Uh, and I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> All right, so besides the song, <laughs> uh, Aquarius, <coughs> Aquarius 
uh, in multiple cultures, uh, Egyptian culture, Babylonian culture, Chinese culture, was all, were all seen as having something to do with water. Because in Egypt, uh, Aquarius was coming up as the Nile was getting ready to flood. Uh, but in, mythology, in the Greek and Roman mythology, uh, Aquarius is seen as Ganymede who uh, was a very pretty boy, and you should never be pretty in mythology because if you are, Zeus is gonna find you. And so Zeus snatched him up and took him to Olympus, and he was the cupbearer. And uh, the story goes that one day he was tired of pouring the wine, or ambrosia, or whatever he was pouring, so he got upset and he just dumped it out, which caused a giant flood on the earth. So he either got put up in the sky as a punishment for that, or because Zeus was very fond of him, he got put up in the sky there. So those are our signs of the zodiac. And I do want to point out just a couple of other uh, really nice things that I, I noticed out on the Logia. And sea animals were one of them. Uh, there's a turtle, a starfish, a dolphin, and a seahorse. And if you're actually out there looking around, every aquatic animal, including cancer, even though it's, uh, it's one of the zodiac signs, all of them have a uh, diamond mosaic around them. And I think that this is a nod to Mediterranean culture, but you may say, but Rachel, there's water all around us. And I'll say that is true, but I have never seen a dolphin in the Detroit River. <laughs> uh, so I am, I'm still leaning towards this being nods back towards the Mediterranean and classical culture. Uh, we also have uh, the instance of uh, the she-wolf and Romulus and Remus out on the mosaic tile. And this goes back to the founding myth of Rome, that as infants, Romulus and Remus were put in a basket and sent down the Tiber. They got stuck by the roots of a fig tree. They were nursed by a she-wolf until they were taken in by their foster family. Or the she-wolf was the uh, cour courtesan wife <laughs> of their foster father. So it kind of depends on whose mythology you're living with. Uh, but this is very important in the foundation of uh, Rome. So again, something that's very important in this culture. So I just bring this one up because this is one of my favorite of the classical ones that I found. So why do we see these things in modern architecture? Well, one idea that I have for this is that it's a matter of consistency because you go outside tonight, you go outside a year from tonight, you're going to look up, you're going to see those stars exactly the way they are. It's a sense of consistency. And I also think that it has to do with the attachment of the mythology to them. It makes sense for a place like a library to have symbolism of things that are very uh, attached to storytelling and uh, the promotion of culture. I also think that it has to do with the, the fact that in the United States, uh, we're very fond of the idea of being uh, the new Greece where we are the democracy of the world. And I don't think this is a new idea. I think this is something that's been going on for quite a while. And so having things like the Statue of Liberty, which is a complete nod to the Colossus of Rhodes, uh, are ways of saying, hey, look at us. We're like this. Or using imagery of uh, Romulus and Remus and the She-Wolf. You know, it's the American dream that you can be an orphan in a basket, end up founding your own city, and taking over all of Europe. I mean, <laughs> so I think these ideas that were really ingrained in the classical world are reasons that we see these sorts of symbolisms still showing up in modern buildings. And I really think that uh, buildings like the Detroit Public Library uh, were a signifier of uh, the transformation of Detroit. The Ford Motor Company uh, came out or emerged in 1903, and this was really kind of the push that started Detroit on its way to peak up in the 50s. And I feel like without buildings like the Detroit Public Library, you know, the building across the street, the Detroit Institute of Arts, which was built in 1927, which is very, very similar in style and building materials as the DPL, things like that wouldn't exist. So I feel like the library really, uh, and the, the uh, imagery that we find in the library really were ways to set Detroit on its way. Because as Gilbert said, great epochs are the dates in architecture. And understanding the origin of gems in the city is a great way to understand where Detroit came from and where it is going. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Rachel, I, I also, I, I want very much for our librarians to speak out. There are, there's a whole table over here of librarians. <laughs> I, I'm glad to have them here. Yes. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you for your talk. And uh, Steve, well, I'll get a question for librarians as well as, as you. Uh, I never realized that the, the DPL was, was put up with, with the assistance of Carnegie Funds. And therefore, is it technically a Carnegie library? Yes. yes. Even though it doesn't fit the, the model of like the other Carnegie libraries, the, the standard, they have that standard kind of architecture for the smaller ones. It is a Carnegie library. It's a Carnegie yeah. library. The $375,000 you donated toward this building. Actually, and the Carnegie Foundation allowed for central libraries to be different. So all of those typical Carnegie libraries that are branch libraries in Detroit and in other towns were kind of follow that template. But you know, like the St. Louis Library and the Detroit Public Library and a few others that got Carnegie funds were, you know, kind of allowed to be bigger and, and better, even though it kind of went against the Carnegie idea. I know we kind of <coughs> talked about it this morning, but was there any rhyme or reason, again, why it started with the craft when we, when we looked at the floor? So that's, that's one thing, is that we see that in most, when you're listing them, you usually start with Aries. That's your signifier of spring. But if you're outside on the Logia uh, at our library, it actually starts with Cancer. And I don't, we were talking about this after, before we came over here, and I was thinking about that we noticed that all of the aquatic animals have the little diamonds around them. Cancer also has this around them, and since the river is south of us, I don't know if maybe that was put there, and being like, there's water that way. Uh, so I'm not quite sure, and I was looking into dates uh, of when the library was founded, when the building was open, when Gilbert's birthday was, to see if there was any, uh, correlation to cancer and I was not able to find anything. So I feel like one thing that I should say is like I've been working on this project uh, since December and this is really just scratching the surface. There is so much more work that can be put into this, so many more things to find. We were discussing that if I wouldn't be graduating in May uh, about applying for funds to actually go to uh, the Library of Congress where Gilbert's papers are and actually go through and see if some of these questions we would be able to find answers to in his papers. Because that's one thing about Gilbert is that he was a very confident person where he was not afraid of having extremely talented uh, artisans working with him. But he also was like, but I was involved with that. That was my idea. Uh, so, you know, I think that a lot, of, uh, a lot of these questions that I've run into and that we've discussed, I feel like if we had access to those papers and had a chance to look through them, that would be something that we would be able to answer better. What was Cass Oh, uh, His birthday's in November, so he's a Scorpio. <laughs> Which means that he, what did Trimalchio say about Scorpios? That he was a uh, cutthroat. <laughs> Here we go. A poisoner or a cutthroat. So Scorpios are always getting a bad rap. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I, I forget which one you said you couldn't find at all. I could not find uh, Leo, and I could not find Virgo. Okay. But do you know some of the painted windows were covered yes. up? Yes. So. Yep. For sure they would be. Yeah, they would be farther back where we can't get to them. At the bottom so. of there. Yes, I, I couldn't remember. What is the date completed for the St. Louis Public Library? St. Louis Public Library is completed in 1913. Um, I, I think your idea about finding out what Gilbert had to say about, you know, what he was thinking when he put these up, or even the library committee you know, did they have some visions as well. But did you, um, I think maybe you said this at the beginning, but let me just ask um, again, it, it does, do you find these mythological and zodiac figures mostly in, in the buildings he built, like the, the, say, the Capitol building and, the, and the, the St. Louis Public Library, and not so much the world, the, the uh, uh, World War Tower? Yeah, I don't think that there, I didn't see, I didn't read anything about there being any zodiac motifs in the Woolworth building. And I don't know if that was because that 
was experience, like if you look at that building, you look at it and you're like, that is a Gothic building. And I don't know if because it was so heavily Gothic, we don't see some of the classical elements that we see when he's moderating between the Gothic style and uh, the Georgian style. I wonder if it has to do with the use of the building. It might. A public, a public building or one that is kind of an identity building and one that's a commercial building. I, you know, I'm just wondering, and Gilbert also came out of a, you know, a time when there were others building in, in these styles as well. And I'm wondering if there were conventions in play. Well, and I know Gilbert designed four libraries, uh, and the library on the University of Texas campus also has zodiac motifs in it. So again, going back to the purpose, this is a place of, of reading and learning. It makes a lot of sense for things that are very much tied in mythology of the classical world to be present there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, another thing about what, what she was saying, the, um, the ceiling at Grand Central Station mm -hmm. there has a, uh, I think that's archi the architect yep. planned that. It's not just an actor <coughs> design. And, and I was I was curious, is it, was Cass Gilbert an originator of the idea of using these motifs or just a one of the many that... No, I don't think so because, like I, like I said, the, the whole use of neoclassical architecture was around for, like, 18th into the 20th century. So seeing these kinds of elements is not an uncommon thing to find. And there are also, you know, because we only had so much time, there are also other uh, elements that are around, like we were, or and I were discussing when I was there this morning, there's something that maybe is a dragon. I don't really know any stories in Greek mythology about dragons, so maybe it's a different kind of animal. There or, is a constellation though. Yeah, there is Draco. Which then, but Draco is, is very, it's a circumpolar constellation, so it's, it's pretty far up away from the ecliptic, so, so I don't know. There's, again, like I said, it's very much just scratching the surface, and there's a lot more uh, that could be looked into, so maybe the next student can take it and run with it a little further. In terms of zodiac representations on the exterior, um, right here at the front, there's also um, zodiac at the very top. Uh, up here? Yeah, and so no, that, above, above there. there. Um, oh, up, yeah, yeah, right yeah right and that between the windows are all. That we here. also see that at the the St. Louis Public Library, where there are medallions outside on the building. Um, did, was any of this part of his European tour when he went around? Did, is this an idea that kind of uh, would have well, developed it, over there? There is a really good book that uh, is by. Uh, Christian Flanders, and this basically has so many of his sketches, so sketches that he had when he was going on his tours. I really think like the design of the Woolworth building, there was a sketch that he did when he was in France that looks very similar to the, the top part of that building. So I, I really feel like just this idea of what he was immersed in when he was doing this really set him on the path to use these kinds of elements in his design. But wouldn't his relationship with the Beaux Arts also kind of inspire all that? I'm sorry. Just the relationship of McKinley White to the Beaux Arts. I'm just kind of making that connection back to Paris, and Gilbert being uh, an employee of McKinley mm -hmm. White, and and then Barbara and I were talking about um, you know how Beaux Arts is the building. I've seen it listed or um, someone describing it as re very restrained Beaux-Arts and others, and you were talking about the sculpture being taken out of the, um, what am I talking about? The, the original designs, there were sculptures and all the arches. Which would have made it more of a Beaux-Arts style, that more ornate or embellished, you know, with the sculptural figures and that. But, um, so I'm just kind of thinking that maybe this goes back to Paris and the Beaux-Arts movement brought to the U.S you know, through the firms like McKinney, White, and Gilbert, and et cetera. Um, anyway, we're all reading about this. We've been working with the students in the class, and we're madly reading, you know, to just continue and, you know, to learn more and more and more, you know, so it's interesting. Um, and you were talking about the Cass Gilbert papers. Um, so I was reading, you know, factoid. There are 12 boxes of um, project files for the DPL in the Cass Gilbert papers. Wow.
so you know there's something in there that would be really interesting. Yeah. You know, maybe there. Wouldn't know. that be, we were talking about, wouldn't it be fabulous if we could work out some grant that we could get yeah. copies so we'd have them over there? Yes. Yeah. So nobody's seen them. Yeah. Right. Or get I the microphone. I emailed um, Gail Sendage, which is doing a lot of, uh, or no, it was ProQuest, they're doing um, a lot of digitization of archival collections. And they said, do you have any suggestions? And I said, please, digitize the DPL papers. And told them where they were, for, you know, Cass Gilbert papers, because they're located um, through the Historical Society in New York. Um, and anyway, I haven't heard back from them. But it is a, it's something that's possible. Digitize, it's just 12 boxes. It's not that much. Somebody could get a grant, you know, maybe the foundation will proceed with something like that and it wouldn't be that much work and they really should have them but That's an excellent idea. yeah but we talked about this you know it is not undoable but you know it depends you'd have to go to New York and look at, at what's there and make sure that they're not just you know elevator drawings or yeah. something like that you know I'd like your seats <laughs> yeah, right. That's all we That was a wonderful presentation. Can you, can, you, can you remind us all when those talk dates are at the, the DPL coming out? There's some talks? Oh, um, can I talk about it Monday? Monday. Well, we have been working with the honors students, honors college students, four students, um, on a class which has been researching for the tour stops on the um, discover the uh, wonders of the UPL. And so on Monday, they're doing their final oral presentations at four tour stops. Uh, the bronze doors, the entry doors on the Woodward side, the children's fireplace, Mary Jane Stratton fireplace, the um, man's mobility mural on the third floor, and the Aesop's fable ceiling um, on the third floor. So they're, it's the students doing their final oral presentations. This Monday. Yes. At 10:30 at the Detroit Public Library, and Barbara is leading the tour. You know, as the tour director. So, and you have docents here. Lots of docents, docents are there. Here, here. We've got six, seven docents here. Right? So, Barbara, do you want to say something to the effect that how the tours have been so popular and a little bit about oh, the background? Yeah, sure. yeah. The tours um, opened December 2013, uh, and since. Inception, since it started, we've probably toured about 1,800 people, uh, from public tours once a month to private tours, a little more intimate, or different um, groups coming in. And it's, it's been a labor of love. The people here who uh, have trained and just wanted to learn more about the building and the stories behind. Um, we take people through the library. We walk through and look at the art and the architecture and the special collections, learn about the library history and Detroit history. Stories are coming out, and we found out some of the things we said are inaccurate. You know, so it's a young tour. Where we're constantly learning things, and this wonderful partnership, this opportunity with the Honors College and Diane Savelt and this, give us an opportunity to research some of the objects that we don't have the time for, or you know, the students look at things differently and found different research. So, if anyone would like to come on the tour, we'd love to have you uh, to schedule a tour. We'd be happy to do that. Because Monday is just a sampling of four objects. But our tour, when we do our tours, uh, usually the first Saturday of the month or a smaller group, we can do something about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, special collections, the Ernie Harwell Room, the Hackley Collection, Burton Historic Collection. We also have, how many years were you at the DPL? I, I, know, I know, because I met you when I first went over right. there. I mean, you have an overview of this. Well, my friend Michael Wells back here, between the two of us, has half a century, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have one other, just, did you, did you come across any correspondence uh, between uh, the relationship between uh, Gilbert and Freddie Wiley? I Which didn't. One? The only thing that I touched on with the two of them was that Gilbert sent him to Rome, Rome yeah. to learn the Renaissance ceiling treatments. Right. That, that relationship really interests me. Uh, well, I, I have a feeling that 
that seems because looking at the work that Wiley did, he was right. very talented, yeah. and I feel like that could be a relationship where Gilbert is like, I picked the best person, but don't forget what I did. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. I've always been curious because the window, the iconography of the window, I mean, some of it is pretty apparent, but some of it is not, and I don't know where he was coming from on that stuff. And I was just wondering if there was any any correspondence between them. I was talking about what he's doing and Yeah, I have. In it. my work, I didn't come across it. It's in those now. boxes. It's in the yeah. boxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's, it could be in the boxes. And Wiley was also from Detroit. Too. Yeah. He was born in Detroit. Right. I was fond of saying when Harvard Law School that he found his true call. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 127. So